Can you hear me? If you don't, just jump and wave. Um, I'll start the poem by Naomi Shihab Nye, who is American Palestinian, wonderful American Palestinian poet. Um, called for Mohammed Zaid of Gaza, aged 15. There is no stray bullet, sir. No bullet like a worried cat crouching under a bush. No half hairless puppy bullet dodging midnight streets. The bullet could not be a pecan plunking tin roof, not hardly, no fluff of pollen on October's breath, no humble pebble at our feet. So don't gently, please. We live among stray thoughts, tasks abandoned midstream. Our fickle hearts are fat with stray devotion. We feel at home amongst bits and pieces, all the wandering ways of words. But this bullet had no innocence, did not wish anyone well. You can't tell us otherwise by naming it mildly. This bullet was never the friend of life, should not be granted immunity by soft saying, friendly fire, straying death's eye. Why have we given the wrong weight to what we do? Mohammed, Mohammed deserves the truth. This bullet had no secret happy hopes. It was not singing to itself with eyes closed under the bridge. <laughs> we will return Monday by Harun Hashim Rashid and translated by, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this, Sadi Simawi and Ellen Dory Watson. We will return one day. One day we will return to our homeland, snug and warm in our hopes. We will return, no matter how much time goes by, no matter how great the distance. So please, heart, do not cave in along the way. How it hurts to see the flocks of birds returning without us. Behind the hills are hills that sleep and wake to our promise. And people for whom waiting is love and a sad song. Lands where willows fill the whole horizon, bending to any water. In their shade, tiny flowers gulp serene perfume, immaculate joy. We will return. The nightingale told me the bulbuls still feed on our poetry. And there is still a place for us between the yearning hills and the yearning people. O oh heart, no matter how far the winds scatter us, we will return to our homeland. It's difficult in a way to read today after the horrendous, <coughs> the horrendous um, events in Nice yesterday, but I suppose we have to remind ourselves that events of this magnitude happen every second week in the Middle East and uh, in Palestine uh, has, has suffered just things on, on a much larger scale. Uh, I'm reminded um, of this little poem by Harun al -Rashid. I'm reminded of something Albert Camus said when he said that in, he was talking about Algeria, he said, in Algeria as everywhere else, he said, um, terrorism can be explained by an absence of hope wasn't justifying it, was just saying it could be explained. <laughs> let it be known, let it be known there will be no peace, because the lodgers in the tents have become fed up with humiliation of living there, become tired of suffering, misery and illness, bored with the death creeping in their bones, sick of life itself, because they are homeless, walking in darkness. And a uh, tiny little point, by a wonderful Greek poet, Titos Patrikos, very, very short, and he spent a great deal of his life um, working for justice and fighting for justice, and became a pacifist in the end, actually. He spent a lot of time in exile, he was tortured, he was imprisoned, and this tiny poem is called Flesh, and it's about what they all have in common. Flesh. My flesh always hurts when beaten, always rejoices when caressed. It hasn't learnt a thing. Every table has got a poem. Poem from 
Ireland. I'm from Antrim. I visited a few years ago and uh, on a beautiful, beautiful, warm August, September day, and we bumped into a man and uh, had a chat. And the chat went in a very strange direction. We hadn't expected it. And there's a little uh, epigraph here from Simon Vile. It's called Antrim Conversation. And uh, Simon Vile says, Pain and suffering are the kind of false currency passed from hand to hand until they meet someone who receives them but does not pass them on. Chalk is stained brown near the waterfall. It crumbles away easily as flint nodules are prized free. The flint itself is poised to split into slivers. A suggestion of blades, a memory of the trade, this shock, wealth engendered. The small tidy man who paused on his stick to talk to us in the lane on this Sunday of rose hips and blackberries had a voice as soft as chalk. He spoke first of weather and houses and sheep, of a life working to put wee shoes on wee feet we talked on and on in September sunshine until nodules of hurt washed out in the stream of his word. He spoke of being shaken awake as a child by uniformed men with guns, of his own young son beaten up, of prison, of not knuckling under, and then of his satisfaction on hearing a man's head had been blown off in a neighboring town. History's Hard cart rattled on, as flint nodules shattered into narrow weapons. We wondered dumb, what shift of Fedra, what metamorphosis might heal such wounded, wounding ground? What do we know of the choke, the flint of other souls, or of our own? Or of what might break in us if history's weight pressed heavily down? How do we know that we could hold the pain? and not pass on the false and brutal coin. And I shall finish. finish with a very light-hearted poem about really just ordinary daily life, which we cherish so much and we've seen such destruction, and I'm sure which we would wish for the people of Palestine to be able to just carry on their normal lives with their families and children and those they love. It's called Classic Hair Designs and it refers to a, a hairdresser's, a rather, uh, rather old-fashioned hairdresser that lived beside us for many years in Galway. A lot of elderly people used to go in and get their hair done. Every day they're dropped off at Classic Hair Designs, sometimes in taxis, sometimes by daughters, often by middle-aged sons in sober coats, who pull in tight by the curb, stride around to the door, and offer an arm. How important this almost last vestige of our animal pelt is. How we cherish it. <coughs> the Egyptians' braided bob, those banded Grecian curls, the elaborate patterns of Africa, the powdered teetering pompadour, the 60s long shining bow over a guitar, and the fine halo of my almost blind 92-year-old neighbor, permed and set in the style in which she stepped out with her young man after the last world war. Thank you for this uh, poetry event. Uh, poetry is part of our culture as Palestinian, and it's really, really important to, uh, it's part of our resistance. Uh, I'm gonna read a poem by Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, it's called On This Earth. Um, Mahmoud Darwish is our national Palestinian poet. Uh, I'll read it in English first and then I'll read the, the origin of Arabic. Uh, on this earth, we have on this earth what makes life worth living. April's hesitation, the aroma of bread at dawn, a woman's point of view about men, and the world's Pascalius, the beginning of love. Grass on a moss, grass on a stone, I should say. Mothers living on a flute's sign, and the invader's fear of memories. 
we have on this earth, what makes life worth living. The final days of September, a woman keeping her Africa tribe after 40. The hour of sunlight and prison, a cloud reflecting swarms of creatures. The people's applauses for those who face death with a smile, a triumph sphere of songs. We have on this earth what makes life worth living. On this earth, the lady of earth, mother of all beginnings and ends. She was called Palestine. Her name still Palestine. Palestine, my lady, because you are my lady, I deserve life. على هذه الأرض ما يستحق الحياة تردد إبريل رائحة الخبز في الفجر آراء امرأة في الرجال كتابات أسخاليس أول الحب عشب على حجر أمهات أمهات تعفن على خيط ناي وخوف العرات من الذكريات على هذه الأرض ما يستحق الحياة نهاية أيلول سيدة تترك الأربعين بكامل مشمشها ساعة الشمس في السجن غيم يقلد سربا من الكائنات هتافات شعب لم يصعدون إلى حتفهم بائسين وخوف الطغاة من الإغنيات على هذه الأرض ما يستحق الحياة على هذه الأرض سيدة الأرض أم البدايات أم النهايات كانت تسمى فلسطين صارت تسمى فلسطين سيدتي أستحق لأنك سيدتي أستحق الحياة and uh, instead I found an extraordinary connection to Irish people uh, because I, I asked him you know, where he was from and he said he was, I'm Palestinian but he has never been in Palestine and we, we understand that very well. A lot of Irish people who migrated all over the world, produced offspring, his parents migrated as refugees to Jordan and then to Libya where he was born, I think it was Libya, he said he was born he's in Ireland now. So he didn't actually understand quite, maybe from the way he responded, he's, he's the chef who's, who was in there cooking that delicious food, quite maybe what it is like in Palestine now. And I'd like to start with a poem that's by an Iranian woman, uh, uh, Karen Kostas, uh, which she wrote for the um, International Poetry Festival in Ramallah uh, two years ago. And it gives a very good picture of daily life for somebody who has to go through what we call checkpoints. But we never really understand what a checkpoint is here. Uh, a checkpoint there is concentration camp protection. Checkpoint Bethlehem by Paris K. Carey. When the soldiers board the bus, the bus in your land bearing an AK-47, you move towards the front. He herds women and children, the old and finally young men, off into the cold metal structure that is your prison and your freedom. The bars and gates, horizontal and vertical, red light and surveillance cameras, strip you to nothing. Another 18-year-old boy in fatigues behind glass stares, but no eyes meet. He locks onto the monitor, scanning your body for evidence of weapons beyond being merely Palestinian. At 65, you cannot accept this. How a boy barking at you in Hebrew can render a woman, a professor, invisible and conspicuous. His voice like a man scolding a dog. Remove watch and belt, place your purse on conveyor belt. You stand frozen, 
waiting for green light and then push the ton style with everything you have. Getting back on the bus to Jerusalem, where you'll apply for a visa to visit your brother in America, becomes an exercise in resistance and hope. On this Sunday, while most in Bethlehem sit in church, you attend this other ritual of faith. The boy soldier, with his feet on the table, waves you past the gate until you stand before him, silent. When you shove your black ID into the slot beneath the window, he says nothing. He turns and waves to another soldier, a young woman, in short braids and tight pants. They quietly exchange words and she rests her hands on his shoulders, begins to massage him, leaning into his ear to giggle and whisper. You wait again, imagining 15 or 20 minutes pass while you stare hard at the floor. This touching and flirtation, a hostage taking. These two could be your students, your grandchildren, even, but you arrest your rage, knowing that the protest will only prolong your wait and getting to Jerusalem on your five-hour permit is the only relief. People who have to go out of what's designated as Palestine in a sense, into the West Bank, have to go through that for work twice a day, twice a day, and it can take endless time. So I thought that was painted, that, that paints that picture very well. A second Palestinian poet I know uh, is, is kind of an angry young poet. And I have some thoughts here that I just got down from the, uh, the, the, the web. The Israelis don't like poetry. It's dangerous because you can say things in it. But sometimes his Palestinian poets say things and they end up in jail. So this says, poetry is not a crime unless Palestinian. And that's how it is there. Uh, this young woman, uh, uh, Tatur, published a poem on YouTube that was about resistance. And she was jailed. The Jewish Voice for Peace people have a campaign running to try and get her freedom. But Nashban Darwish is no relation to the great Palestinian Darwish poet. But he lives in Jerusalem. And I met him first actually in, in Iowa and then read with him in uh, London at the International Arab Festival there three or four years ago. And he's, he's kind of sharp and hard and not willing to concede. And in response to a, a very famous poem by Mahmoud Darwish called Identity Card, he wrote his own Identity Card. And it's, I think, a wonderful poem. Identity Card by Nakwan Darwish. Despite, as my friends joke, the cards being famous for their se severity, I was gentler than a summer breeze as I embraced my brothers in the four corners of the world. And I was the Armenian who did not believe the tears beneath the eyelids of history's snow that covers both the mortal and the murderers. Is it so much, after all, that has happened to drop my poetry in the mud. In every case, I was a Syrian from Bethlehem, raising the words of my Armenian brother, and a Turk from Konya, entering the gate of Damascus. And after a while, I arrived in Bavyadar Wadi al Sir, and was welcomed by the breeze, the breeze that alone knew the meaning of a man coming from the Caucasus Mountains, his only companions, his dignity, and the bones of his ancestors. And when my heart first tread on Algerian soil, I did not doubt for a moment the fact that I was a Mazi. Everywhere I went, they thought I was an Iraqi, and they were not wrong in this. And I often, often considered myself an Egyptian, living and dying time and again by the Nile with my African forebears. But above everything, I was an Armean. It is no wonder that my uncle was the damn times and that I was a Hizazi child cuddled by Umar and Sophronius when Jerusalem was opened. There is no place that resisted its invaders except that I was one of its people. There is no free man to whom I am not bound in kinship, and there is no single tree or cloud to which I am not indebted. And my scorn for Zionists will not prevent me from saying that I was a Jew expelled from Andalusia, and that I still weave meaning from the light of that setting sun. 
In my house, there is a window that opens on to Greece, an icon that points to Russia, a sweet scent forever drifting from Hijaj, and a mirror. No sooner do I stand before it than I see myself immersed in springtime in the gardens of Shiraz and Isfahan and Bukhara. And by anything less than this, one is not an Arab. In my in this collection that was published back in 2007, there's a short poem called Random Contact. It's also about a bullet. The first poem was read about a bullet. And the connection with the one I read next is that it's from the same family. Uh, this young man had just completed university and was about to become a journalist. He was sitting at home in his house in the countryside in the upstairs window. And this is what happened. The man in the watchtower touched an easy trigger and a bullet left its chamber zipped out of the gun muzzle on its way. A lead heart set in shell and socket pending destination. This journey is its life. Between the barrel head and the soft mulching of skin, muscle and bone, perhaps it asked a question, sensed its transitory freedom. The man in an upstairs room half a mile distant in his hillside home had been penning a story on his new desk by the window this evening of evening. I was Amjad, 22 years old. And I was having dinner with the family. Uh, he was a nephew with his uncle's family, whose livelihood was a fruit stall on the side uh, of the road, not very far from Hebron. And the poem is called, A Fruit Stall by the Hebron Road, Trashed by the Military. The oranges tumbled down the hillside acknowledging the innocence of flowers, leaping clumps of dried up grasses live in the broken earth. Dusting morning ripeness from petals not yet awake. Sumac, sage, lupin, poppy, capos white and yellow, purple-toothed orchids, cyclamen, horn of the gazelle, hyssop and chamomile, oleander and a sweet-scented rose. Some, set into little dimpled graves, lie still in a forever stay. Watch as others bounce and hope on recklessly, downhill, to where the valley floor awaits forever in evicted certainty. To hear some hesitantly stumble through, expecting the midday sun to be theirs, but it is not. High in its sky, it binds a heat as indifferent as if aware of such shadowy famines in the soul. And just outside Jerusalem is a village called Lifter. A hillside village, village, you can't really see that, but just a hillside village. The houses are all empty, and the families all have the keys of the houses with them, wherever they're living in, uh, as, you know, be it in Jordan, in Ireland, wherever. They have the key to the house. And this is a poem called Lifter Longing. When the mist of darkness slips away, sneaking down the slopes, hiding from the eyes that stare, when light uplifts and through an opening air reveals its voices, when shadows disappear, then, in the bright of day, the heart breaks once more. Breaks as it broke in 48 and 49, and 50, 51, and on, and on, and on, and on into a mosaic of faces, crackling aged wrinkles round the eye and door and set mold of each home. Famine homes in Akil. Abandoned homes on islands of water or of land, by rivers, lakes, and limestone shale, where house is home and empty, people gone. Lifters' homes squat here, still here in their aureole of longing, sunken wells of longing, and they stare. Across its stony history, belonging, its stony will, belonging, its empty walls, belonging. And when all passers by are home, it shouts into its sky stone words, not steel, not gas, stone kitchen words of home. Lift the voices, know that they belong to hear, belong, belong to hear, 
belong here. How do I sleep? Why the spectre of torture is in my eyes. I purify the world with your name, and if your love did not tire me out, I would have kept my feelings a secret. The caravans of days pass and talk about the conspiracy of enemies and friends. Beloved Palestine, how do I live away from your plains and mounds? The feet of mountains that are dyed with blood are calling me, and on the horizon appears the dye. The weeping shores are calling me, and my weeping echoes in the ears of time, the escaping streams are calling me. They are becoming foreign in their land. Your orphan cities are calling me, and your villages and domes. My friends ask me, will we meet again? Will we return? Yes, we will. We will kiss the bejewed soil, and the red desires are on our lips. Tomorrow, we will return, and the generations will hear the sound of our footsteps. We will return along with the storms, along with the lightning and meteors, along with the hope and songs, along with the flying eagle, along with the dawn that smiles to the deserts, along with the morning on the waves of the sea, along with the bleeding flags, and along with the shining swords and spears. Well, uh, Abdel Karim al-Karmi is a Palestinian poet. Uh, he's, he's known as Abu Salma as well. He was born 1907 and died 1980. Uh, he's from Haifa originally, um, and he was a very famous uh, Palestinian poet. I'm going to read the poem now in Arabic, uh, the same as Abdullah's poem. فلسطين الحبيبة كيف أغفو وفي عيني أطياف العذاب فلسطين فلسطين الحبيبة كيف أحيا بعيدا عن سهولك والهضاب تناديني السفوح مخضبات وفي الآفاق آثار الخضاب تناديني الشواطئ باكيات وفي سمع الزمان صدى انتخاب تناديني جداول شاردات تسير غريبة دون اغتراب تناديني مدائنك اليتامى تناديني قراك مع القباب ويسألني الرفاق إلى لقاء وهل من عودة بعد الغياب أجل سنقبل التربة المندى وفوق شفاهنا حمر الرغاد غدا, غدا سنعود والأجيال تصغي إلى وقع الخطى عند الإياب سنعود مع العواطف داويات مع البرق المقدس والشهاب مع الأمل المجنح والأغاني مع النسر المحلق والعقاب أجل ستعود آلاف الضحايا ضحايا الظلم تفتح كل باب Thank you um, I'll start with um, some lines um, uh, from who has been figuring here today uh, and they begin, when the plains disappear, the white, white doves fly off and wash the cheeks of heaven, with unbound wings taking radiance back again, taking possession of the eater and of clay. Higher, higher still, the white, white doves fly off, uh, if only the sky were real. A man passing between two bombs said to me, Cypresses behind the soldiers, minarets protecting the sky from collapse. Behind the hedge of steel, the soldiers kiss under the watchful eye of a tank. And the autumnal day ends its golden wandering in a street as wide as a church after Sunday Mass. To a killer. If you had contemplated the victim's face and thought it through, you would have remembered your mother in the gas chamber. You would have been free from the reason for the rifle, and you would have changed your mind. This is not the way to find one's identity again. The siege is a waiting period, waiting on the tilted ladder in the middle of the stone. Alone, we are alone as far down as the sediment, were it not for the visits of the rainbows. 
we have brothers behind this expanse, excellent brothers. They love us. They watch us and weep. Then in secret they tell each other, ah, if this siege had been declared, they do not finish their sentence. Don't abandon us. Don't leave us. Or loss us. Between two and eight martyrs each day, and ten wounded, and twenty homes, and fifty olive trees. Added to this, the structural flower that will arrive at the poem, the play, and the unfinished canvas. Well, now I'll read a few pieces of structural flowers, which are my poems in uh, response to. Uh, the horror that's uh, going on there from um, a book, uh, as Catherine has mentioned, it's called uh, Gaza Ground Zero. And uh, it um, features, um, I suppose, laments, maybe you could call them, or poems for uh, people, young people mostly, who are called dead martyrs. Um, they, just to mention their names, there's one young lad called Ali Safi who was shot in the chest and who died from his bullet wounds. A young lad who took time out of school to look after his two brothers with disability. Uh, there is um, a young lad called Jihad Shahada al Dafari from Bethlehem uh, who, was ki- who was shot and left to bleed to death two poems for him. Uh, and there is um, a poem from um, uh, Western Janine, uh, a young man called Mohammed Murad Yahya, who was shot at a wedding. So they are just um, some examples. But the one I read is from um, a young man called Abdullah Golanayat. Now, like my, I have to apologize for my um, total inadequacy with Arabic pronunciation, but I do my best anyway. Um, lots of these flash by as on Facebook. So it's a cascade all the time. In terms of daily life in Palestine, and yeah, it's an horrific cascade. But how do you get to this? With this. I'll come back to that later. Yeah. But there was one uh, that came in front of me of a young man uh, just crying to heaven for made of his that had been killed. And immediately something um, <coughs> took over my head, and it was from a famous painting by Goya, Alfred de Mayo. I don't know if you know it, it's from the Spanish rebellion against the French in, in Paris, and then the war. And uh, this, uh, uh, the French were executing a uh, group of um, young rebels. And there's this young lad in the centre, and he has this bright shirt on him. And it lights up the entire painting. And similarly, in this photograph, there's a young man at the centre of it, and his shirt just lights up the entire scene, almost accidentally. Hmm. Could be one more Goya, just one more disaster de la guerra. These stocky Palestinian martyrs are Catherine Malik, who with their hands and hope raised the army chief of Abdullah Gunanit. Young man, 22, on the road to work on a poultry farm. The IOF shot him in the back, then chased him with their jeep, pin him to a wall collapsing on him, their jeep overturning on him, gun at all. The IOF boys exulting in their game, a leg severed, a spine crushed. Medics are halted by the jackals, till Palestinian brave bare hands claw them off too. The central Palestinian, one hand upraised, another Goya, another Tres de Mayo execution. Youth who illuminates the soulless, venomous Saturn, the law that stinks will praise, exonerates Rabbi Sulk and Salm. A little hit boys are shattered. Moloch prayed, soldiery jeering, cheering Abdullah as he lies screaming in agony. There are no words for this, but they are had better. 
A favourite pastime of the application courses is apparently watching the young people uh, bleed to death. They refuse access to ambulances. I thought this was an isolated thing when I read it up the first, but no, keep on occurring and occurring and occurring. Uh, so it's the most sadistic scene um, affair if one, one can imagine. <coughs> the olive trees, of course, are, um, before I come to the, the olive trees, um, <coughs> Irish mentioned uh, the homes that are being demolished. And uh, this has been going on since, 18, since 1948. Day after day after day. The Western media doesn't give a goddamn book. It doesn't feature any heart. And this is called April Fool's Day 2015. I was reading Pierce in his famous statement, The Fool's, The Fool's. In the dead of the night, I'm reading Pierce. Well, into the early hours here, to be precise. Another depression is passing over with high wind and the rain adds to the pools and midland fields. The soldiers come, over 100 of them, to demolish the house of Nuruddin Amro and his brother Sharif Amro. Both men are blind. It hardly matters. Yahweh long ago gave up the count of the hairs and the heads of Palestinians. Nuruddin Sharif. Their 79-year-old mother, wives and kids are in the house. The soldiers cut the electricity, the phone lines, internet, they start to demolish while the family are still inside. The uniforms have dogs and even aircraft thundering overhead. They lock all the family in one room while they knock down the house around them. Four long hours it takes to bulldoze to rubble and toss the kids' toys on top. Israelis destroy the garden, kill the children's pets, rabbits and chickens. In their exodus, the family may not salvage anything. Soldiers leave them a wailing wall to wail against. No electricity, water, toilets, or a telephone line. The holy city is expanding. What's another Arab family? The old fool soldiers threaten they will be back. The heat on occurring is the olive tree from day-to-day uh, -to -day depredation, uh, vandalism, and uh, obviously uh, agricultural policy on the part of the Israelis uh, to wipe out, um, first of all, the olive trees which sustain the people, but also the very powerful emblem um, for Palestinians. <coughs> and I use a header from <coughs> an Irish poet, Charlie Donnelly, uh, who died in the Spanish Civil War, when the last words were, mm -hmm. um, he was looking up at the olive trees and the leaves were falling off and with the bullet slime, <coughs> he said, even the olives are bleeding. As salamu alaikum salam, peace be to you, my uncle. He greets us with an olive in his hand and I wonder how can peace ever be with us. The soldiers are taking chainsaws to the olives. We'd sooner trade our throats, change places with the olive trees. Olives have been here 5,000 years, seeing the coming and going of our sires. North to south, a month-long swathe of families comes harvesting, metal by sunlight, moonlight. Our fingers calloused, stained, small price to pay upsetting the Israeli scanners, alien checkpoints, occupation. Our roots go back a long way too. Bulldozers move into us, two by two. <coughs> um, the, po the book itself is called um, Gaza Ground Zero. It came out last year and it was really um, an adventure with Mike Rahn from Bantry as a writer to read at Bantry. I sometimes prefer for it and, uh, and had these poems gathering and I that would be a good idea if we brought out these poems here so they don't um, exhaust the supply of poems uh, written uh, by any means and um, back to this in a moment sometimes uh, I wish I didn't have to write these poems and how nice it would be just to write pleasant poems uh, like I wish himself it would be pleasant just to sit down and write a poem about having a cup of coffee you know, admiring his son, 
but the situation it calls for more than that. <coughs> now, when we were bringing out, about to bring out the book, there was a cover that I wanted, and it was of this. Um, it's a scene in Gaza. It's a springtime scene, and um, it's a field uh, of mustard seed. And if you know uh, the Irish fields, the area where the oil seed rape is that tremendous go golden yellow in it. Okay. And I took the photo from um, Facebook and I record, I come back to that now, but when I come back, my references are a bit uh, hazy. And I could not make contact with the, the photographer himself. <laughs> and here I must thank Patty on another match because it was she actually that. Um, I was able to get me permission to use these pieces of uh, art from Palestine and photographs for my last book, which I just had in a moment. So what we had to do then was we had to um, go for a rather anodyne cover, uh, which is gold, but behind this gold you've got to sense uh, the fields of, um, of uh, mustard seed. And of course, if you remember, or if you know about it, the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but it grows to be... Um, uh, it grows to the extreme. So it's a symbol of um, Palestinian resistance, I would say. And um, <coughs> the, the context is uh, this is all ground that is cratered by Israeli bombing. But if it is cratered by Israeli bombing, it merely throws up the seed of the mustard seed. You have this in Ireland very you have the poppies coming up all over the place. So the mustard seed comes up. Okay, so that's the scene to it. <coughs> and it's a poem is meant to be a celebration of Palestine, last word in one proud nation. And uh, books, this book has got to Gaza, and um, I was told by people uh, by contact in that that uh, this poem was, was really liked. So, I mean, that's best feedback a poet can ever uh, guess. It might be a very imperfect poem in many ways. And, really rushing these pieces. I had to change my style of writing completely because there's no time to recollect and tranquility. You have the page, you get it down, and that's it, and it's wanted yesterday. Right? So it, it's a test of what you can do, uh, hopefully. Um, the, 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 uh, the thing won't look uh, too much. Uh, the, uh, the book itself is uh, structured between two poems. It's um, Gaza, about the year 2014 with the destruction of life in Gaza and then there's uh, 2015. Of course, destruction is still there but hope never fades. Spring 2015 and the Gaza craters of last year are endless. Across them the, mustard, the waves of mustard seed go endless. A mocking back answer to Tel Aviv, it's death the levellers and their high noon. These fields of neo gold resurrect forever with their own mutiny on. A father and his daughter wander in them in their sunlit Elysium. Black mustard, brassica negra, that annual like <coughs> that annual like rape the bees at home come in. Look long at them, these curtain blooms that are not lilies of the Gazean fields, for there are few fields left untorched, only what the bombed flesh yields. And the bombed earth they say, the dreamy potter fashioned a long time ago before the killing started. Times in the burning bush you could see the awesome flow. Solomon with his five hundred wives add in the concubine never made love in the like these or David or Yeshua in the scriptural smiling his all-inclusive paradise. Smallest of seeds, birds sing in its branches. In the world's forgotten estimation, Palestine lives. In all its dereliction by the Mediterranean one proud nation. And for us, it's our <laughs> I'm sorry I'm going over time. That was my problem. I brought my watch and my phone off as well. Um, uh, the, just a, a very a quick one. I was delighted that the, this, the, um, the readings are taking off. We've heard that in water the night before last. And what struck me was that there is a gathering of poets in Ireland. Obviously, there are young poets across in Palestine. There are poets writing on their own websites. What should be possible is, and I say to somebody from experience, of bringing out an anthology yearly or some memento 
how the work that's being done for the people that die in any one period. In other words, you must answer fire with fire. And in some quality, it's fire, but it's fire, and yet it's praise that will not send you sleep. So I'll talk to Katha to about this later on, maybe. I think it, it's worth doing, and it's a way of answering the people who are trying to obliterate them for, forever. If you have a book with an ends written in it and the photographs written in it, they will never be forgotten as long as people can read. Okay. Thanks very much. Hamza was just an ordinary man, like other in my hometown, who work only with their hands for bread. When I meet them the other day, he land this land was wearing a corpse on morning in windless silence, and I felt defeated. Days rolled by, I saw Hamza nowhere, yet I felt the bill of the land was having in pain. Hamza, 65 weeks, heavy like rope on his own back. Born, born this, his house, a condom screamed, and tie his son in a cell. The military rules of our town later explained it was necessary for law and order that is for that is for love and peace. Hamza opening the window, face to face with the sun blazing outside. He cried, In this house, my children and I will leave and die for Palestine. Hamza Voice a cold clan across the Budain cells of the town. An hour later, and became ambiguously, the house came crumbling down. The rooms were blown to, to pieces in the sky, and the, and the bricks and the stones all burst forth. Born dreams and memories of the lifetime of labor, trees, and some happy moments. Yesterday, I saw Hamza walking, walking down the street in our town. Hamza, an ordering man, as he always was, always creeps in his generation. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here and be part of this um, extraordinarily um, important festival and it's great to stand and read with other great poets um, you know, and be in solidarity. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of poems uh, of a couple of uh, Palestinian poets and then a couple of poems um, of my own. The first one is... Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, should I just give them that? Thanks. Uh, the first poem is, as Catherine said, by uh, Mahmoud Darwish and it's called We Travel Like All People. We travel like all people, but we return to nothing, as if travelling is the way of the clouds. We buried our loved ones in cloud shadows and between tree roots, then told our wives, give birth to hundreds of years so we can complete this departure toward an hour of country and a metre of the impossible. We travel in carriages for psalms, sleep in the tents of prophets, come out of gypsy words, measure space with a hoopoo's beak, or sing to distract the distance from who we are and wash the moonlight. Your road is, so, is long, so dream of seven women to carry this long road on your shoulders and shake the palm trees for the women so you may know their names and the one who will birth Galilee's son. We have a country of words, so speak, Speak that I may lean my path on a stone made of stone. We have a country of words. <coughs> speak, speak that we may know an end to this travel. Um, and it was, it was in 2014 for me when I really started um, to speak out more publicly about Palestine. It's always been a cause, it's been really dear to my heart. But um, that particular bombing campaign, especially with the news bias that was going on with the BBC particularly, and even with the Irish Times, you know, headlines, it was just, um, I thought it was a really important time to, to start speaking out. Um, 
and to echo the great poet, playwright and political activist Harold Pinter, um, the desperate plight of the Palestinian people is the central factor of world unrest. Um, and Pinter's well worth reading um, his Nobel Prize winning speech on politics, art and truth, I think it's called, is, 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 is amazing to read. Um, and in fact, it was Pinter as well who made me want to speak out more as well, because when during the Iraqi conflict, the last war, um, he was asked, you know, what can people do? What can, what can we do, you know, to, for the cause? And, and Pinter said, the first thing you can do is use your voice. You know, and it sounds such a simple and small thing, but it's so important that um, we stand up and speak out, you know, because to sit on the fence is really to be complicit with what's going on. So I feel very strongly about that. Um, and only this morning I read a piece where Israel had gone public with details of a proposed bill which would force internet companies such as Facebook to remove content which the Israeli government deems uh, to be promoting terror. So this is proof of the power of individual voice, of how important it is. You know, people say, oh, Facebook, it makes no difference, these petitions. It shows that it is making a difference um, because they're worried, you know. And by us speaking out, we become the storytellers, we become the narrative instead of becoming passive reviewers, um, viewers of the news which dictates their agenda um, often, um, we become a storyteller, so it's really important. Um, I just want to read a poem of mine, which is in the forthcoming collection, The Art of Dying, um, and it's called Operation Cleansing the Leaven, um, which is the name given for the 1948 campaign, which saw one million Palestinians killed or displaced uh, during the ethnic cleansing on which the Israeli state was founded. Um, and which saw the British forces uh, wash their hands for what happened. And cleansing leaven is, uh, refers to the Jewish religious practice of eliminating all traces of bread or flour from people's homes on the eve of Passover. And the military name for the operation is, is another terrifying um, example of how war criminals um, hijack religion for their own purposes. So operation cleansing the leaven. Observers spend the weeks in a flurry of house cleaning to expunge every scrap from all parts of our home of the home. <laughs> Flour is treated as vermin and must be quashed at all costs. Law requires the elimination of olive sized or larger quantities of leavening. But a good housekeeper leaves no seed unturned. The cracks of kitchen counters are thoroughly scrubbed to remove any traces, however small. Then, when every last molecule has been disposed of, observers wash their hands and every part of their person to avoid any suggestion of contamination. Um, and the next poem I'm going to read is by Taha uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Palestinian poets, and it's called The Place Itself, or I Hope You Can't Digest It. And so I come to the place itself, but the place is not its dust and stones and open space, for where are the red-tailed birds and the almonds green? Where are the bleating lambs and pomegranates of evening, the smell of bread and the grouse? Where are the windows, and where is the ease of a mirror's braid? Where are the quails and white-footed, fettered horses whinnying, their right leg alone set free? Where are the wedding parties of swallows, the rites and feasts of the olives, the joy of the branching spikes of wheat? And where is the crocus's eyelash? Where are the fields we played our games of hide-and-seeking? And where is Kazim? Where are the hyssop and thyme? Where is the kite descending on chips from the heaven's heights as the old woman shouts at it? You took our speckled hen, you whore. I hope you can't digest it. You there, in the distance, I hope you can't digest it. Huh? Muhammad Ali? Not the boxer, Muhammad Ali. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and this is a poem, uh, another new poem as well, from the forthcoming collection of mine, and it's called um, Anatodi Phobia. Anatodi Phobia is the fear that somewhere in the world 
there is a duck watching you. No matter where you are, a ringed teal stares down its long bill, searing your skin. You may be on a lavatory 12,000 feet above sea level, and yet you turn cold as the leer of a mallard stares up through the bowl. The trauma often goes back to a time in childhood when the victim was scared or injured by a duck. Perhaps they were flapped at in a park, then tripped and scuffed their knees. But anatodiphobia can sneak up on you out of nowhere. It can appear like the seasonal migration of hooper swans to the lake, lakes. Anatodiphobia is irrational. It is a creature with wings that cuts through everything. It is the all-seeing eye of a jealous duck. There is no duck in the sky, and yet people will kill to tell you there is a duck. While the condition is rare, it is possible that somebody somewhere will develop it now. There are various evolving suppositions across a wide spectrum of science and medicine on anatodiphobia. Many of them, ironically, appear to be peddled by quacks. <laughs> Nevertheless, propounding theories on quantum mechanics make it even more probable that there is a duck looking at you. There is a duck. There is always a duck. It is a creature with wings that sees through everything. It is what soaks you when you wake in the middle of the night. Some people let it fall off them like water, others <laughs> drown. <laughs> And last poem of mine, and then I'll finish one short poem by Darwish again. Um, or, shall I, or shall I just read Darwish's poem? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. 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 Okay, this is short enough. This is called Angry Birds. I'm lost in this, which is a computer game you play on your iPhone and things. Yeah. Angry Birds. <laughs> it's become a film, everything else. Good. I'm lost in this world of crazy kamikazes, selflessly flinging their harlequin bodies against timber planks, panes of glass, and metal bars to snuff out the spread of swine. Wasted with flu, the only thing I can do is play a game on my phone, the single premise of which is to catapult birds against a litter of pigs, hidden in various structures. Struck down with a fever over a hundred, health feels like a childhood that can't be recaptured. Poorly as the prodigal son who squandered everything. I can create chaos with the stroke of my finger, send raptors to collapse complex constructions, pickaxing and squawking into scaffolding. Shooting starlings explode into formations tumbling down on a battalion of pugnose snorters who keep growing and dying with every level of delirium. I can only dream that these feathered friends hold some answer, that they are my deliverers carrying me home, wherever that may be. And the last poem is very short, and it's by Mahout Darwish. And just to say, shukran. Um, it's been wonderful to read at this event. And that's the extent of my Arabic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Viewpoint. The difference between Narcissus and Sunflower is a point of view. The first stares at his image in water and says, there is no I but I. And the second looks at the sun and says, I am what I worship. And at night, difference shrinks and interpretation widens. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much again to Basil for, for producing this beautiful food for us and uh, for the entire <laughs> Falafel and hummus, and I don't know what else. That was spinach, uh, spinach, 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 spinach,
they support the restaurant to buy, buy some coffee, buy some refreshing drinks, and if you can get a reservation, come for dinner. Uh, you can bring your own wine. They don't actually serve alcohol, but you can bring your own wine, and it's really fabulous. Uh, so thank you again, Basil. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of poems uh, by Naomi um, Shihab Nai that uh, Moya also read uh, some poems of hers. Um, this one is called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with clams and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say it is I who have been looking for and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. And this, this is another poem by Naomi Shihab, nice Palestinian American poet, and has spent um, time in Palestine. She went to college there and was there for some of her childhood. Uh, this is a beautiful poem, So Much Happiness. It is difficult to know what to do with so much happiness. With sadness, there is something to rub against a wound to tend with lotion and cloth. When the world falls in around you, you have pieces to pick up, something to hold in your hands, like ticket stubs or change. But happiness floats. It doesn't need you to hold it down. It doesn't need anything. Happiness lands on the roof of the next house singing and disappears when it wants to. You are happy either way. Even the fact that you once lived in a peaceful tree house and now live over a quarry of noise and dust cannot make you unhappy. Everything has a life of its own. It too could wake up filled with possibilities of coffee cake and ripe peaches and love and love even the floor which needs to be swept, the soiled linens and scratched records. Since there is no place large enough to contain so much happiness, you shrug, you raise your hands and it flows out of you into everything you touch. You are not responsible, you take no credit, as the night sky takes no credit for the moon, but continues to hold it and share it, and in that way be known. <laughs> this is a little poem I, I just uh, wrote for, for today, and uh, it uh, came out of a couple of things. Last year at Palfest, we had a family day with them, um, where we had little paper boats down in Sandy Mount Strand, among other things, with children sailing little paper boats. And uh, also the, the uh, Freedom Flotilla, uh, various uh, attempts to break the blockade of Gaza with uh, brave people. Uh, and some of them uh, were killed in the attempt, uh, and some Irish people and Irish MPs and whatever went as well, um, who, to try and challenge the blockade of Gaza. So this is called Paper Boats. I fold my poems into boats to carry my heart an origami flotilla bobbing towards the occupation. Between the paper creases, some words are legible, a love note on the sail, defiance on the flag. And when the gunships spot the word freedom rushing the shore, they will blast my fleet out of the sea. The poems will sink first and then rise, or erupt skyward and then fall, scattering rags of verse across the water. But I folded some so carefully that their blank sides might float incognito past security. And maybe one will beach where children have played 
and you will spread it open with your hands. And know that someone whose rage is not brave will fold poems into boats to wash up on your sands, till on every shore are hands making boats and your waters are white with fleets of our hopes. Racism has many guises, and I think um, you know it's very upsetting what's happened today in Nice or yesterday in Nice. Um, uh, it's, it's been on all our minds, I'm sure. And also, I think think of people who've been affected by that today, and also of people who will be affected, uh, you know, as a result of that, um, in various ways. I'm looking for a poem here or there. Is. Um, so I'm going to read this poem called Stowaways. Um, particular take on racism. And a true story. <laughs> the woman around the corner says country people are taking over Dublin. She says you can see the return tickets floating down the Liffey every Monday morning. Country people are letting on, they're coming up for the weekend. Then the cute tours <laughs> are slowing away, getting jobs in the newspapers, running the civil service, writing speeches for TDs, and signing graphs for the relations. I think of them crouched in the leaky hold of the city, sharing a damp cabin with hard-up Dubliners, or washed up in that bed sit that made me cry. The rooms split, sorry, the rooms split in three with hardboard partitions, like a homemade doll's house. The one window favoring the living room, the kitchen and bedroom lightless. The old landlord inviting me to sit in a chair pushed against one wall, my feet touching the blinded fireplace on the other and tears itching my eyes. For years I hoped whoever lived there had some happiness to fall back on and got out alive. The woman around the corner wouldn't trust anyone from outside Dublin. Just because they're from two counties away doesn't mean they're not immigrants, she said. To be honest, she's not sure about people from the north side either. But as long as they cross the river again after work, she says she's happy enough, though she never looks it. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll finish with a poem about olives. I'm just going to thank everybody for coming again. And uh, thanks for the wonderful poets for performing. Moy Cannon, Cannon uh, Adam Wyatt, John Ennis, and Seamus Cashman. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you Catherine, Abdullah, and, well and Amir. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> this is called Six Scenes with Olives. Over my parents' bed, the thick crucifix was a memento mori. Christ could slide away to reveal a space for water, beads, and a file of rich oil the extreme unction. Two, in the place of the olive press, Gethsemane, he was crushed, the chrism forced out of his shriveling skin and falling as blood onto the garden. Three, in the lost Caravaggio, Christ on the Mount of Olives, he is buckling over two sleeping forms, while Peter, startled awake, is Judas in the taking of Christ, looking fearfully to the future. Four, no one is poor who has an olive tree, the old chef tells me. He is looking back to Palestine, his eyes black and soft with home. This tree is the god in our garden. It is not food alone. It gives us cures and candles, leaves to feed our goats, summer shade and winter wood. In my country, the olives take us over, breathe out of our skin and hair till we are part of each other. Five. As a child, I was sent to the chemist for a tiny bottle. It was the mirror of the medicine cabinet, warmed drop by drop for earache and cradle cap. Its scent of somewhere else, warm grass and ease. Six. Sit opposite me now, and we'll anoint our tongues, dip our bread in unctuous meadow sweet or bitter green, say a rosary of olive stones. I won't ask you to stay awake when the world presses down. I won't chide your, chide your lidded eyes. Your sleeping form is warmth enough. One day this right we share may be extreme. Till then, my love, I'll bless our ordinary function. Thank you. Thank you.